Thank you, Steve. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I wanted to start out by talking about drinking water. And in talking about drinking water, I, I, you really can't understand drinking water until you look at the history of drinking water and the fact that for most of human history, drinking water looked a little bit like that picture. Um, so the question is, how did we get from drinking water out of streams uh, in a system where there were very few people around, so it kind of worked relatively well, it was relatively easy to find clean water, and there weren't likely to be people upstream defecating into the water, so it was okay. But most of us think about drinking water as something more like this, and the question is, how did we get there? Well, we actually have a very sophisticated sense uh, system for the chemical and visual analysis of water, um, and that is, um, how we have survived in many ways. If we were confronted with a glass of water that looks like this, we would probably look at it and not drink it unless we were extremely thirsty. So the first thing, our first line of defense, whether it be contaminated food or water, is to look at it. And if, they, if, the, if the water looks a little more like this, we might smell it, okay? And our sense of smell is an incredibly sophisticated chemical sensing system. And it's interestingly, it's not just by chance that it's positioned right above our mouth because that's where it needs to be to protect us from foul, um, from contaminated food and water. If it smells okay, we might taste it. And the fact is, um, again, our last line of defense is our, our sense of taste. And the la very last part of our tongue is senses bitter because it, you have to be able to gag uh, if it's if you suddenly decide at the last minute that this might not be something you want to eat. And to this day, we rely on our senses. It's actually um, very difficult for us to deal with health risks that are, to our senses, undetectable. This is one of the great challenges we still face. And, you know, if you, if you have a sandwich that's been in the fridge for a while and you pull it out, you're going to look at it. And if it's not moldy, you're going to smell it. And if it doesn't smell bad, you're going to taste it. And when you take a bite, if it doesn't taste too bad, you might finish the sandwich. Well, things weren't always so crowded. Populations grew and people had to figure out something better than just wandering into the stream and drinking. Um, these guys are violating probably the first rule of drinking water safety, which is you always drink upstream from your camp. Um, and I suspect that a number of these guys probably got sick doing this. Um, and the problem is, as po populations continued to grow, you couldn't be sure there wasn't somebody else upstream from your camp, and so you would have another problem. We'll move forward here to the 17th century and the city towns around Florence, Italy. And in these city towns, you have to understand that all of the animals and people were concentrated in here. There would be thousands of animals with all of their waste inside this city. You would have people living here with no really uh, no good system for getting rid of human waste. And so the waste would accumulate. The prevailing theory of disease was known as the miasma theory, which was this belief that so there was something in foul odors that made people sick. And so, and this was not an unreasonable belief. It was, it was wrong, but it wasn't unreasonable. And it was still being dominated by the sense that our senses are our best line of defense. And so the first public health study that was ever conducted was the Florence Health Magistrate in the early 17th century went out to these towns and they looked at them and they um, tried to figure out what they could do to improve health in these, um, in these city towns or in these walled cities. And they, they came up with the reasonable notion that you should get all the garbage out of the city. But in this, there is a ringing phrase. They said, they should take all of this foul stuff and take it to places where they can do no harm. We are still looking for that place. Um, and this notion of taking things and putting them someplace else, whether it's burying hazardous waste underground or dumping waste into the oceans, we are still haunted by this notion that we're going to find some place on the earth we can dump stuff and it won't come back to find us. All right, let's now move forward to the 19th century. This is London in the 19th century, and cities have become huge, 
And they have grown together in this strange way because they are, are um, really, if you, you, we think of London as this big metropolis, but it used to be a bunch of farming communities that got bigger and bigger and sort of coalesced into this city. And at the turn of the uh, 19th century, there were about a million people living in London. There were about 200,000 cesspools underneath London, and cesspools got all the liquid waste, and then the, the fecal matter went into privies around the city. So again, you can imagine, on a hot summer day in London, you have rotting garbage, you have human waste, you have whatever's in these cesspools fermenting, and it was just a very unpleasant place to be. And the miasma theory was still a very potent theory in terms of explaining the causes of disease. What this did was set the stage for some of the most devastating disease outbreaks in the history of the world. This uh, is the Blue Death. It's cholera. And the reason it's called the Blue Death is you get such severe diarrhea that within a matter of uh, days, if not hours, you get so severely dehydrated that your blood, your heart can no longer pump the blood through your body because it has so little water in it. It thickens up and you turn blue and you die. And cholera would come sweeping through from India and there were four major pandemics. The first kind of stopped in the mountains of, of Russia, but by, as transportation routes improved and people could get farther before they died, the disease spread farther and farther. And so the next pandemic that came in the 1830s reached all the way to England. And nobody could understand what was causing it. They still believed in the miasma theory. Here are people in the streets of Paris burning the cholera from the air. They're, trying to, they're just lighting these huge fires trying to stop the outbreak, the epidemic. When you arrived at the train stations in Paris, you went into these little rooms and they had these vats of carboxylic acid, which was this horrible, acrid smelling stuff. And again, supposedly it was going to combat the cholera and purge you of cholera. Probably if you had cholera, it just made you feel worse. But that tended to be the case for most medical treatments of the time. I mean, they, people were clueless and it was terrifying. The disease would come and you would be perfectly healthy one day and dead the next and people around you would be dying and you didn't know what was causing it. I mean, if you look at some of the advice they were giving, um, you know, don't drink, don't sleep near a draft, uh, don't drink cold water when you're hot. I mean, actually, maybe not drinking the cold water might not be a bad idea. But they were clueless. And the one guy who figured it out is this guy. His name is Jon Snow. And Jon Snow, was a very unlikely character to do anything great in medicine. He was the son of a laborer. He had 11 siblings. He grew up uh, very poor, but he happened to have an uncle uh, who had a connection with a doctor in Yorkshire and got him a spot as an, as an apprentice with that doctor. And he worked his way th up through the medical system um, and became a doctor. And he just, by chance, happened to be at the epicenter of every cholera outbreak. The first time cholera landed in England, it landed in the coal fields of Yorkshire, where he was taking care of patients. And he looked and he said, he began to think then that there was something wrong with this notion that the foul odors were spreading the disease. But he, um, you know, he was a young guy, he was still an apprentice. But then cholera came again, and when it got to London, he was a doctor in London, and he began to realize that there was something about drinking water that was related to cholera. And there, in fact, he invented the whole field of epidemiology just so he could make his case. And he put together very compelling evidence. I mean, if you look at it retrospectively, you think, how could anybody miss this? But the fact is, the medical establishment had, had no interest in his ideas. And I remember when I first was studying this and I thought, you know, how could anybody be so stupid? If you look at the evidence, this is obvious evidence. But if you, you know, these were in fact not stupid people. People. This is Thomas Wakeley who founded The Lancet, Benjamin Hall, ben, Big Ben is named after this guy and he was the first health commissioner in London. And William Farr was the, founded the field of medical statistics. But none of these guys would believe him. And if you think about it, 
What they couldn't believe is that anything that you couldn't smell, you couldn't see, you couldn't taste, could harm you, especially in the way that cholera did. I mean, they even knew about microbes at the time, but if, again, if you think about it, I mean, there, were, there was actually a book showing all the microbes that were in the water around London, but they, these, if you needed a microscope to see it, how the heck could it kill you? Nobody could believe this. There was no germ theory. A really, in some ways, Jon Snow was, was, you know, anticipated the germ theory, if not was the first to describe it. And in fact, the, the uh, medical leader of the, public health leader of the day was this guy, um, Edwin Chadwick, with the fabulous swoosh. And he, is, uh, he led a group called the Sanitarians, and they were, wanted to clean up the streets of London. I mean, that's a laudable idea, but he really believed that this was going to stop cholera. One of the, the priorities was to get human waste out of the city. These are the night soil rakers. They used to come in at night because nobody wanted them to do this during the day, and they would shovel out the privies, and they would take the waste out to the farms where it was used as fertilizer. And Chadwick had the idea that we could take, if we could find a way to get that waste out of the city more easily and out to the farms, we could solve our problems. And what he had in mind was this device, which is the water closet. I, I, I love this picture because this little bit of PR here, you've got little fish swimming around in the water tank. I like that a lot. But this device had been around for over 100 years. And it was useless because at that time, the, the, the sewers in London were only to drain the streets. It was illegal to connect a cesspool to a sewer. All right, so we had, and so he, he um, thought, why don't we take these devices, we'll run some pipes out to the farms, and we can just flush all this waste out to the farms using water closets. Um, there, there were a couple problems with this. One was the cost of running another set of pipes out to the farms. And the other was the fact that there was this burgeoning trade in bird poop. The guano trade was uh, providing a very cheap source of fertilizer, which was much easier to work with than human waste. And so the guano trade really, um, coupled with the cost of running those pipes, led Chadwick and the sanitarians in another direction, and they made a very fateful decision. In a report in 1842 where they looked at how to, uh, how to address this issue, he wrote that, you know, the objection to this is you're going to pollute the Thames if you do this. But the Thames was filthy. There was rotting garbage in the Thames, rotting animal carcasses. Even, you know, whatever was washing off the streets, the filthy streets of London was already in the river. A little bit of human waste, what harm could it possibly do? And again, here's a second ringing phrase that this would be of almost inappreciable magnitude. And, and you know, many of our, the greatest environmental mistakes are founded in the belief that what we're doing, it's just a little bit. It's just a little bit of CO2. It's just a little bit of uh, toxic waste. What harm can it do? And so they went ahead and they connected the cesspools to the sewers. And they ran it into the river. And, I mean, it may be a little hard to believe it that, right now, but people were drinking the river water from the Thames. That was the, much of the water in London was coming from the Thames, and now they were going to pump human waste into the Thames. And so the next cholera epidemic that came was even more devastating than the last, uh, primarily because of this change. There was... Um, this is, a, this is a street in London called Broad Street, and it, this is, it's the site of the most famous outbreak in epidemiological history, because it was a, an outbreak that Jon Snow studied in great detail. It was actually called the outbreak at Golden Square, which is really funny, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. But we epidemiologists kind of like to believe that Jon Snow rode in on a white horse, grabbed the handle of the Broad Street pump. I don't know if any of you know the story, but the idea was he took the handle off the pump that people were getting contaminated, where people were getting contaminated water, and he uh, saved the day, stopped the outbreak, and everybody was happy. I mean, he, he himself didn't really remove the handle from the pump. He convinced the local boards to remove the handle. But by the time they took the handle off, the damage had been done, 
everybody that was going to get cholera had gotten it, and everybody else had gotten as far from the, the area as they possibly could, because it was terrifying. You didn't know what was making people sick, and you just wanted to get away from it. This map is very famous. It's the map of the cholera outbreak, and these little black squares are cases of cholera, um, or deaths from cholera. This is Broad Street, and right there is the Broad Street pump. And you can sort of see that the cases are clustered around that. Actually, oddly, this is Golden Square over here uh, with one death next to it. And I think the naming of it might have had something to do with the sanitarians not, not, not wanting to acknowledge what Jon Snow was saying. But Snow is blaming it on the Broad Street pump. But actually, this is really bad epidemiology. It makes for a good story. But you know, there could have been anything on that street or in this area that was making these people sick. And he didn't really know uh, whether the people that didn't get cholera were, were whether or not they were using the Broad Street pump. And in fact, uh, the guy who did the, uh, the good epidemiology on this is a guy that nobody's ever heard of called um, Henry Whitehead, who was a deacon at the local church. And he was on the same committee as Snow that was trying to figure out what was causing this outbreak on Broad Street. And he went, and, and he knew everybody in town. He thought Snow was dead wrong. So he went out, and he went, and he asked everybody, because he, you know, he knew people. He could just, it was easy for him to go house to house and see who drank from the pump and who didn't. And the guy had the intellectual honesty when he got the results to say, you know what, I've just proved that the pump was causing the outbreak. And he and Snow became fast friends, and he actually had a picture of Jon Snow hanging on the wall of his office till the day he died. But the biggest myth of all here, and the one that we still struggle with today, is that if you come in with the science, and you come in with solid scientific proof, that you're going to make people change. And in fact, the thing that made the biggest change here is, uh, is something much more, much more simple. This is, if you really want to make change under these conditions, what you do is you take your, parla your, your governing body, the parliament, you put them in a building next to a river, and you wait till you have a very hot, dry summer. This was a summer that, that, that was so hot and dry, the Thames became a sloshing cesspool. It actually has a name, the year of the great stink, historically, because it was so foul. And the, the members of parliament would run to, the, you know, they'd go to the far recesses of the parliament building and breathe literally through scented handkerchiefs as they passed a, a law, the, the most expensive and a public works project in the history of England to build these massive pipes and take all the waste from London downstream 15 miles to a place where it would do no harm. And which is, you know, which is true unless you happen to live 16 miles downstream from London. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, if you look at this, it, you know, it could be taken to validate Chadwick's point of view just as much as it could validate Snow's point of view, which is it got rid of the smell, the cholera outbreaks pretty much stopped. And, uh, but either way, it solved the problem. But it didn't provide the, the proof of cholera being a waterborne disease, didn't come until these guys came along. This is Louis Pasteur, who gave us the germ theory. And we have Robert Koch over here, who had discovered the cause of tuberculosis. And the two of them had this great rivalry trying to find out trying to identify the bacteria responsible for cholera. And it was particularly challenging because the outbreaks in Europe had pretty much ceased. And, so, and there is no animal model for studying cholera. You can't, there's not an animal you can take into the lab and get sick and study it. So they had to have an actual epidemic. So they actually, they went to Egypt um, where there was an ongoing outbreak and one of Pasteur's top scientist actually died in the quest of cholera, and he gave up, but Koch went on to India, and he finally identified the bacteria in a water tank. Interestingly enough, he still had to use epidemiology to prove his case, since you could only, uh, the only animal that was going to get sick is, was human beings. Um, now, old ideas die hard, and usually old ideas don't die until old men die with them. This is Edwin Chadwick, and you can see now that his swoosh has grown to epic proportions. Um, and he went to his death, sure that Snow was wrong. This guy over here is Otto von Pettenkofer, 
And he was a, he did not believe that Robert Koch was right. He was so convinced that, that the bacteria that Koch had identified was not the cause of cholera that he got a sample from Koch, had it sent to him, gathered a group of friends and colleagues at his university, and took the vial and he drank it. Um, and I don't know whether you know, it was just dumb luck or whether some lab assistant knew the old man was crazy and, and heated the stuff up and killed it, but uh, he didn't die, so clearly whatever was in there had been deactivated by the time he drank it. But ultimately, um, the wisdom of, of Pasteur and Koch ruled the day. Cities began to realize they had to get clean supplies of water. Um, they instituted sand filters. They, they um, looked for clean sources. Um, if, in the United States, we had a somewhat unique opportunity because we had large, pris relatively pristine wildernesses. And so the, a lot of the large East Coast cities in the United States went out into the woods and they found a stream and they dammed it and made huge reservoirs. This is Dover, Massachusetts. This is the way Dover, Massachusetts looks today under the Quabbin Reservoir, which supplies water to Boston. So they, there are dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of small towns across New England disappeared in the quest for water. <clears throat> In Chicago, the, the quest for water um, took on a different turn because they drank out of the Lake Michigan, but Lake Michigan was also where their sewage went. So they had a little bit of a problem and they sort of had to chase their tail. They kept taking running pipes farther and farther out into the lake. They ultimately ran a pipe three miles out into Lake Michigan to try to get away from their own sewage. And when that failed, they came up with an astonishing solution. The, they realized <clears throat> that the divide between water running into the Mississippi and water running into Lake Michigan was actually very close to Chicago. And they decided what they could do is come in with the kind of earth moving equipment that was used to build the Panama Canal and they could connect the Chicago River with the Des Plaines River and they made the Chicago River run backwards. And so today, instead of the Chicago River emptying into Lake Michigan, it empties out of Lake Michigan and runs uh, over to the Mississippi, which is great if you're in Chicago, not so great if you live, again, downstream on the Des Plaines River, which St. Louis does, and they sued Chicago, but Chicago was bigger and stronger and won the suit. But even that wasn't enough in many cases because um, people were still getting sick so they had you know, clean reservoirs, they had sand filters, but it still wasn't enough. And they, this is the Boonton Reservoir in, that provides water to Jersey uh, City in New Jersey. And the guy that built it um, had a problem after he built it, which is that there were actually towns upstream where people had typhoid, and there were typhoid outbreaks in Jersey City. And he had a huge problem on his hands because he wasn't going to get paid. And he wanted to get paid, and he looked around trying to figure out what he should do. And what he s happened upon was the fact that in the stockyards in Chicago, uh, a few years earlier, they had decided to put chlorine in the water supply uh, that provided water for their cattle in the stockyards. And he decided, well, if it is good enough for the cattle in Chicago. It's good enough for the people in New Jersey. And so he started bubbling chlorine gas into the reservoir. And the outbreaks stopped. And really, uh, this was one of the most important public health interventions of the 20th century. And public health always gets prompt, you know, prime news coverage uh, here on the back page of the New York Times, new water purifier. There's two phrases in here I want to highlight. One, so successful has been this experiment that any water supply, no matter how large, can be made as pure as mountain spring water. Um, we probably don't think of chlorinated water that way today, um, that the chlorine is going to kill all microbial life and leave no trace of itself afterwards. And the effect was pretty dramatic. The effect, uh, this is the rates of waterborne disease in the United States uh, starting in 1920, it was, the rate was coming down like this. Chlorine's introduced here, the rate is coming down, and it steadily drops. The reason it's rising again here is 
there's just a new set of diseases that are being classified as waterborne, but they aren't the severe diseases that are killing people. This is the case fatality rate from these waterborne outbreaks, and it too was dropping, and it's essentially zero. It is very rare, um, with some notable exceptions, for people to die from waterborne diseases in the United States today. Um, so till the mid 19th century, mid 20th century, we were in good shape until we started to realize that maybe that water wasn't as pure as mountain spring water until we started to think about chemical risks. This is the Cuyahoga River burning because it is so contaminated. Uh, and we started to think uh, with the rise of the environmental movement that maybe there was a problem with the contamination of water with chemicals. And that maybe that this guy playing in his basement with elemental chlorine is not doing such a good thing. He's uh, maybe not such a good idea. I mean, chlorine actually was uh, the, first, the, the first gas warfare was waged using chlorine gas. And so people started to look and see whether there was a risk from the chlorine that was being added to drinking water. And in particular, they looked at some of the compounds that were being formed when you add chlorine, because there's almost always some organic matter in the water. That's why you're adding chlorine, to kill the organic, the, the living things in the water. And what happens is you form these chlorinated compounds uh, called chlorination byproducts. And I'm not going to, I will spare you too much explanation of this slide, except to say there were a whole series. These, each line is representing a study of the relationship between bladder cancer and chlorination byproducts in drinking water. And the, the results look like they kind of go up and down. But in general, you'll see that these, this, if it's above this blue line, that's an elevated risk of, of bladder cancer. And these little red lines represent the estimation of risk. And there is about a 20% increase in the rate of bladder cancer associated with drinking chlorinated water. And it appears also there may be a risk of colorectal cancer. Um, the you know, chlorinated organic compounds tend to have uh, hazardous effects. And in this case, we have a problem because chlorination, which was saving lives, was now posing a threat. Um, so we've had, to, we'll, I will come back to the solution to that problem in a minute, but there was one other issue with chlorine. Chlorine was sort of, cities were relying on sand filters and chlorine. And the, if you, you know, if you go back in history, what happens when you come up with the perfect, when you build the Great Wall of China, you know, uh, Attila is going to get his tr troops and ride around it. And, the, and, the, um, and Genghis Khan is going to ride around the Great Wall of China. When you build the Maginot Line, the Germans are going to build tanks and they're going to drive around it. When, you put in, when penicillin comes into play, bacteria are going to survive that can live in the presence of penicillin. And so that's why we have a problem with antibiotic resistance. In the case of chlorine, this is what the perfect offense looks like. This is cryptosporidium. It is a, a um, waterborne pathogen. It is extremely small, meaning it can get through a sand filter. And it is totally resistant to chlorine. Um, in the lab, if you want to isolate cryptosporidium, you actually put bleach, it kills everything else, and leaves the cryptosporidium behind, and you have relatively pure cryptosporidium. And when cryptosporidium hits uh, the water supply of a major city, it looks like this. There was a massive outbreak in 1993 of cryptosporidiosis in, in Milwaukee. 400,000 people got sick. About 4,000 were hospitalized and roughly 400 people died as a result of this outbreak of cryptosporidiosis. It was the worst outbreak of waterborne disease um, in the 20th century in the United States. Okay, so what do we do about this? How, how are we going to fix the system? Because um, the first challenge, there's, there's sort of four parts to a water supply. One is the water treatment. One is the pipes to get it to the house. Um, one is the, uh, the use of the water in the house. And the last potential line of defense is at the tap in the house. The, challenge of water treatment is you have these huge plants. Most cities have, this is this, the water treatment plant in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is over 100 years old. And that is just not that unusual because 
building these massive plants is a tremendous job. Finding land to build these plants today is a very difficult job. And then once you have that plant in place, what are you going to do? You can't take it offline, tear it down, and build a new plant. People are depending on it. So you have a, a major problem. But what we, you know, one of the things that cities around the world and in the United States are, are trying to do is improve their water treatment systems by um, switching to microfiltration, switching to other options that provide a much cleaner supply of water and require much less in the way of disinfection. The water distribution system is the, the, the thing that doesn't get talked about much because it's, it's a difficult problem and it's, you know, pipes buried under streets are not a thing that get people excited, but a lot of pipes buried under our streets are extremely old. Uh, many is, you know, it's often not unusual to have pipes over 100 years old. Cities don't even know where all the pipes are because there's, you know, it's been sort of cobbled together over time. And these pipes, the, the initial pipes, the first cast iron pipes had a life of 100 years. They were replaced about 25 years later by pipes that had a lifetime of 75 years. And about 25 years after that, there was a different design and it was a pipe with a lifetime of 50 years. And if you do the math, there's a convergence there, and we're, we're approaching that convergence um, now in cities around the country. The other issue in water distribution is lead pipes, um, which often lead from pipes in the street into homes, and anybody who's ever bought a house has probably had to deal with the problem of how do you get that lead pipe out and replace it. And here's what that problem translates to. This is the rate at which we're going to have to replace drinking water pipes in the United States as estimated by the EPA. And we are just on the upslope of this curve. We're right about here. EPA has estimated from, to get to 2023, we're going to have to spend about $184 billion replacing pipes. And to get to 2040, we're up, the bill is up over a trillion dollars. And the problem there is um, Nobody has ever gotten elected to public office by saying, I am going to tear up your streets, I am going to inconvenience you, and I'm going to put in new pipes, and you know, they're going to be named after me. <laughs> but if you don't do anything, this is kind of what things end up looking like. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a devastating problem that literally is uh, one that we have buried. In terms of emerging threats to drinking water, we are still dealing with the, the problem that faced those Roman soldiers or London, which is increasing populations putting increasing pressure on water supplies. And we have drinking water plants that really were not designed to remove chemicals from drinking water. They were designed to remove microbes from drinking water. And so we don't really have a good system for getting those out. And that's why we find things like pharmaceuticals in our water supply, because the wastewater treatment systems are definitely not getting chemicals out. So all, so all the chemicals that are, all the drugs that are either dumped into toilets or are uh, metabolized partially by humans and urinated out are winding up in our water supply. And, and most uh, bodies of surface water in the United States have detectable levels of pharmaceuticals in them. The other threat we face is that the, our water supplies are a vulnerable target of terrorism. In um, 2002, there was a plot to put cyanide into the water supply of the U.S. Embassy in Rome. The Italian um, security people figured this out and managed to stop them, and these guys were sitting in a room with maps and barrels of cyanide. And this, you know, this was, these, are, these are all they had to get access to, is these water pipes that run under the streets of of Rome. And there have been other, uh, a number of reported plans interrupted for terrorist attacks on water systems worldwide, United States, France, Italy, South Africa, Philippines, Turkey, etc. cetera. Um, and the uh, U.S. In national intelligence community assessment of the global water supply stated that th these are going to be increasingly likely to be targets for attack in the future going forward. So we need to sort of rethink the way we deal with drinking water. Now, we talk about drinking water treatment plants and the water coming out of them, but less than half a percent of the water that comes out of drinking water treatment plants 
is actually drunk. And so we have, we, in essence, in the United States, we dumb down our drinking water standards because of this. Because we have to treat 100 gallons of water for you to have your two liters of water. And we, we want a standard, we want to protect those two liters of water, but the cost of treating the 99 and a half gallons of water to make that possible is, uh, is prohibitive if we want to really have the kind of water quality that we should have in the United States. The water is going, you know, it's lost out of pipes, it is used ex extensively for watering lawns, dishwashers, showers, um, wa clothes washers, and just this tiny slice up here is actually run out of the tap and consumed. Now, climate change is typically thought of as a problem of water uh, affecting water quantity, but water quantity and water quality are just are completely linked for a couple of reasons. One, if you have a drought and water supplies are reduced every time that, that you, then you are concentrating contaminants in those water supplies. Um, and if you have extreme storm activity, which is also associated with climate change, you're going to have combined sewer overflows and the hundreds of billions of gallons of combined sewer overflows that run into surface water all around the United States every year uh, increase. And those combined sewer overflows, remember Chadwick and hooking up the pipes, well, we're dealing with that problem all over the United States today, actually all over the world. This is Katrina. This is what that drinking water plant outside of New Orleans looked like after Katrina hit. They had to shut down the water supply. Um, and so this is sort of an, one other way these water supplies are, are vulnerable. Um, this is a group of books that I was act, asked to review recently. And the interesting thing about all these books is the word crisis is prominently featured in the, tri in the title. And I have to say, uh, when I say crisis that many times, uh, there must be a problem. Uh, the crisis, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the crisis of running out of water. And I, I think we have to look at that a little more carefully. I mean, this, this is, you know, this is the blue planet. There is no shortage of water, specifically. The problem is having the right amount of water of the right quality in the right place at the right time. And we have this astonishing hydrologic cycle that constantly purifies water and is the reason that we can continue to exist on the planet. And what we're talking about doing is replacing the hydrologic cycle with um, human systems like a desalinization plant. It's estimated that every major city in Australia will require a desalinization plant to be built in the next 10 to 20 years uh, because of demands on water supply and they just don't have any other place to go for more water. This is actually the, a desalinization plant outside of London where they have uh, also have problems providing clean water to the city. And it's something that's being talked about all around the world, whether it's either desalinization plants or plants to purify uh, wastewater to the point where it's drinkable. The other way we're dealing with water and trying to, in essence, do what nature has done historically for us is to move water around. This is the most massive water distribution project in, in human history that's happening in China with a whole series of dams bringing water from southern China up to northern China, um, a little bit the way California brings water from the north to the south of California, um, but on a much grander scale. The problem with this is what we are trying to do is something that nature has done for us for a very long time. And nature, the vast, the bulk of the solar energy that hits the earth is used to drive the hydrologic cycle. 48% of the sun's energy reaching the atmosphere gets through to the earth's surface. And of that, and 25% or more than half of this amount is used for, to, for evaporation, another 5% for convection to move that 
that is moving those, the air waterborne, the water in the air around in the form of clouds. And the fact is, if you took all of the energy consumed by humans to all of the, the fossil fuels and all the nuclear energy, and you applied it to try to drive the, wor the world's hydrologic cycles, it wouldn't last for half a day. So we are taking on an epic task, and at some point, we're also going to run out of some of those fuels. So we should tread very lightly on the notion that we're going to just simply uh, move in and take over from Mother Nature uh, and replace the hydrologic cycle with uh, human activity. Here is you know, part of the problem. We're going to run out of oil. We're going to run out of coal. And probably a good thing, maybe we'll run out in time to slow down global warming. So what do we need to do to have sustainable, safe water? We have to have aggressive source water protection. Um, we need to make massive investments in our infrastructure. Um, it's going to take a radical re-examination of our systems for treating, distributing, and using water. That comes back to this notion that we're only using half a percent of the water that's treated to drink. Uh, there are countries that, which actually have separate water supplies for drinking. The Royal Chemical Society of England has suggested as much that, that England should be pursuing that and Great Britain should pursue that. We should look at advanced treatment for, for treating the water that we drink so that we can, um, because the methods we're using are not removing chemicals and they're not removing, um, they're, they're requiring high levels of chemicals like chlorine to disinfect. So advanced water treatment is essential if we want to have a safe water supply. And ultimately it's going to take political will because these are expensive changes, and they don't tend to be the uh, top of the list kinds of topics. But I've, I've only talked about the easy part. The hard part is the tragedy that's happening in the developing world, where some two billion people lack access to even a simplified uh, simple improved latrine, One point, about a billion people have no access to any type of improved drinking water source. And so you wind up with a picture like that. Um, 1.6 million people worldwide die every year from diarrheal diseases. And about 90% of those who die are children under the age of five. 160 million people die every year from schistosomiasis, 500 million, uh, I'll give you the numbers here, 500 million at risk of trachoma, which is, causes blindness, um, infections from parasites and infections from hepatitis are all related to contaminated water. This is a, a, a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions Everything I just talked about pales in comparison to the challenges faced in the developing world. In the, during the Rwandan wars, people fled Rwanda, Rwanda in huge numbers, and they fled across into Zaire, and they wound up in refugee camps that looked like this. So this is rocky soil. This is, this is, this is volcanic soil, and the rains would come down and they'd wash across this volcanic soil down into a, a lake below the refugee camps where people would drink. And this set the stage for the worst cholera outbreak in human history. In a matter of a, about a week, 60,000 people died. Um, I talked to some of the people that were there and um, these people were shaken for life by what they saw there. Um, not only that, but the, the um, refugee, the workers in the refugee camps who were trying to help often had to face armed Tutsi rebels coming in and taking their water 
the clean water that they were going to give to these people to save their lives. All right, this is where I make the cognitive leap. So when Dr. Davis came and told me about her interest in cell phones uh, and cancer, I said, look, this can't happen. You, cell phones put out microwave signals, microwaves just like you use in your microwave oven, and these are relatively low energy. They are relatively, actually, even though it's called micro, it's actually a relatively long wavelength, and it's much bigger than any atom or molecule in the human body. And what it does is it warms things, primarily. And so how was that going to cause cancer? And as I talked and I thought about what she was saying, I mean, Dr. Davis said, you know, she had exactly, I had exactly the same thought when, you, when I first heard about this idea. And I, um, and I thought about what she was saying, and I thought about Jon Snow. Because if you think about it, he was dealing with an invisible threat, like the signals from a cell phone. He was dealing with a, um, he was suggesting a relationship between exposure and disease that defied the existing science. I mean, the people who are most vehemently, uh, vehem most of the people most vehement in, in saying this can't cause this are the people who study biophysics and say there's no way that that wavelength of, of electromagnetic field is going to cause cancer. So, um, I decided I had to do a little like Jon Snow and listen more carefully. This is uh, just from a, a paper that actually hasn't even come out yet. It's about to come out. And this is what it, if, you, if an 11-year-old holds a cell phone to his ear, this is the way the radiation penetrates into his brain. And maybe it's causing nothing. I mean. You know, it's penetrating to a brain. Is that, are those microwaves doing anything? Well, we don't know. But clearly, there's no question that the microwaves from a cell phone penetrate into the head of, a, of anybody that's using it. This is a study where they took cell phones and they put the cell phones up to the head of a subject that they were studying. And they looked at the metabolism of glucose in the brains. So these red areas indicate elevated rates of glucose metabolism. This is somebody with the cell phone on. They're not talking on the cell phone. It's just turned on, and it's just producing a, the cell phone signal. And this is um, with the cell phone off. And you can see that there's an increase in metabolism of glucose in the brain. What's going on? I mean. The person, the subject had no way of knowing that phone was on or off. So um, somehow that, cell, that radiation is affecting the action of cells in the brain. This radiation can get into the brain. It can affect the brain. There's evidence that it increases the um, rate at which uh, fluids leak out of the blood vessels in the brain. It opens up the blood and brain barrier. And the World Health Organization in 2011 decided to classify cell phone radiation as a possible human carcinogen. Now, that's a, um, it doesn't mean that it's definitely a human carcinogen. It, the word is possible. Um, but this is based on a whole series of studies, primarily on a series of epidemiologic studies that were conducted that showed a relationship between brain cancer and heavy use of cell phones. There's, there's a fair amount of controversy over this, but there's definitely some positive evidence. Another, another area where people have looked at cell phones is if you, know, you carry that cell phone around in your pocket and it's producing all this radiation. Um, it, you know, could it affect the development of sperm? And that's been studied in a number of ways. A um, couple of studies I'll show here. One was a study where they looked at cell phones, they took sperm and they exposed it to cell phone radiation. And they found that the, um, if you look here, the cell, the, the sperm that was exposed uh, the, 
had far fewer viable sperm in it, far fewer motile sperm in it, and far more damaged sperm uh, in the vicinity of that cell phone. The other thing that's ha the, the, the way it's been studied, people have looked at the sperm counts of men and classified them based on how heavily they used their cell phones. And there appears to be a dose-response relationship between how heavily you use your phone and the um, sperm counts of men. Now, could this be explained by something else? I mean, could it just be that men that you heavily use cell phones are also high stress, they have other exposures? Yes, I mean, you, you know, it, it's very hard to prove these things absolutely, but there's, again, evidence that we, there may be issues related to the viability of sperm exposed to cell phones. There's, other, there's a whole raft of other studies. There's hundreds of studies that have been conducted looking at the relationship between cell phones and, and health. Um, some positive, some negative, but, and there's definitely controversy over this, but there's enough smoke to, be, to have some concern that there might be a fire. Um, and so what does this mean? We've been conducting, we are conducting, a huge uncontrolled experiment. In the last 20 years, cell phones have gone from being a relative novelty to being something uh, that everyone has to have. And in, in fact, there are more cell phones than people in the United States today. So what do we do about that? Well, this is what the cell phone industry does. If you, go, if you go to your phone, you can actually find a warning on your phone. You probably didn't know this, but there is a warning on your phone. If you go to settings and you go to about, this is on an iPhone, I don't have an Android, and you go to legal and you go to RF exposure, you'll get this warning and it's in very, very fine print. I, I, I don't worry if you can't read this because you probably can't read it on your phone either and they don't let you enlarge the text. So. Um, but, so I'm going to enlarge it for you, so you can actually read it. And among the things that it says is um, that you should use, a built, use either the speaker phone or headphones. You probably didn't know that your cell phone provider was recommending you not hold the phone to your ear. And they are recommending that you um, keep the body, when you carry the phone, that you keep it at least 10 millimeters from your body. Um, now, so if you've got a phone in your pocket, unless you have really, really thick pockets, you're not carrying it 10 millimeters from your body. Um, you know, if you carry it anywhere against your skin, you tuck it into your, your bra or you um, carry it in you know, some other way next to your body, you carry it in a vest pocket, you are exposing yourself to um, higher than recommended levels of radiation. And, but this is sort of typical of the way the, the industry has dealt with this. They want this problem to kind of go away. Some cell phone manufacturers have taken this seriously to the point where they've dramatically reduced the amount of radiation that the cell phone produces. There are ways to do this without really impairing the functionality of the phone. Um, but in a sense of being the, the precautionary principle would suggest if there's enough smoke around and there's relatively easy solutions to reducing exposure, you ought to do it, okay? I mean, I can't stand here before you today and say with absolute certainty I can say cell phones cause cancer, but I can say they might. And I can say that if you want to be uh, sort of exercise reasonable caution, you probably shouldn't be walking around with your phone like this. Remember, I was, I was visiting Deborah and, and we, we went skiing and she, she, uh, we saw this woman with her cell phone jammed up inside her, her helmet, talking on her cell phone away and, and you know, Dr. Davis being Dr. Davis went over to her and said, you know, <laughs> that's not a good idea. So it's, it's really just a matter of precaution. And 
The, it, what it gets to is the very notion of how we approach risks where we don't have an obvious risk and we're particularly uncomfortable with it because it's this vague risk where we can't sense even what's going on. We don't know when we're being exposed to a cell phone. We don't know when we're um, drinking water contaminated with cholera. And so how do we deal with risks, emerging risks? I mean, the existing paradigm requires that we have proof of risk before we do anything about it. Well, if you want to, and, and the ultimate proof is often an epidemiological study. And epidemiological studies are notorious for being, you know, easy to criticize, difficult to prove. And so you can carry on debates about risk long after the initial suggestion of risk is present. And certainly that is the case. I mean, if you can carry on a debate about the risks of cigarette smoking, for as long as we manage to carry on that debate, um, you know, we still sell the damn things. And, you know, they are absolutely the most toxic thing you can expose yourself to. Then, you know, how long do we have to debate cell phone risk before we do something about it? The existing paradigm says people need to die before we can have proof. And in fact, a lot of people need to die. The numbers of people who died while we were debating cigarette risk is, is really uh, a horrifying legacy. So I think that we need to change that paradigm. Whether it's Jon Snow taking, you know, it taking 20 years to prove that cholera was waterborne, that drinking water could make people sick, whether it was the decades that it took to convince people with certainty that cigarette smoking was killing people and needed to be drastically curtailed, um, or whether it is another emerging risk, we should probably act with precaution. We should probably act um, to if there is an easy way to curtail the risk, we should do it. I am not saying that we shouldn't be using he cell phones. I mean, I think they're amazingly powerful devices, and we all know the many ways in which they can be useful. But there are many ways they can be hazardous, not just in terms of the radiation you get, but from you know, the effect on social relationships, the effect on children. Um, and we have unleashed this thing without really taking the time to think of the impact it's having, because we love our new technology. So um, on that note, I'd like to close and, and open this up uh, for questions. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Are they doing anything um, on a more regional level about getting pharmaceuticals out of the water? She, she was asking if, if they're doing anything on a regional water level about getting pharmaceuticals out of waters. Um, not specifically, but in general, I think drinking water plants are moving to treatment options that remove chemicals. Um, well, either um, like nanofiltration or Carbon filtration, um, both can provide some chemical removal. Those are, those are actually the main options. The, the, the one thing I didn't talk about in drinking water and the, the, is the notion that um, I personally think every drinking water tap should have a filter on it. I think point of use filters should actually be part of the entire drinking water supply system. And actually, I, I would like to see water utilities get involved in helping you know, provide these on a costly basis, helping maintain them. It, because if you have you know, all those levels of possible contamination, why not put your filter right next to where you drink the water so you don't have to worry about bad pipes, you don't have to worry about inadequate treatment, you don't have to worry about somebody contaminating the distribution system. So I think, you know, I'm a big believer in point of use filters. Hi, good morning. 
I was wondering, um, I was intrigued about desalinization plants. Yeah. Given today's technology and, you know, as we sit here today, what would be the increase in cost to uh, average consumer with desalinization versus, say, our current water bill? Um, that's a good question. Uh, he was, uh, and I'm not, sh I have to say, I don't, uh, I don't have the answer in hand. I think, um, Clearly, it's, it's, I mean, we pay so little for our drinking water that the cost of those plants is actually not that huge, except for the fact that we're wasting most of that purified water, you know, in, in, in the sense that we're going to you know, use it to flush toilets or wash cars. So that's, you know, the, one of the biggest cost drivers is just the way we use water. Uh, more than just the cost of the treatment plants. And, and the cost will depend a lot on where that plant is built, how it's powered, um, but the economics of those plants, I, I don't know well enough to give you the answer that I think you'd like to have, so sorry. Very interesting. Um, what do you think about the, the use of geoengineering and its effect upon the higher disrupting the hydrological cycle, which is what's happening right now in California. Um, what's, and what sort of geoengineering do you have in mind? Well, geoengineering, using aerosol sprays in the sky to try to block a certain percentage of the sun's radiation, solar radiation management, and also uses of uh, weather modification that actually moves the jet stream, which is causing part of the global warming. I wonder if you have any opinions on that. Um, I think you're getting outside of my area of expertise a little bit in terms of weather modification. Um, I, you know, I think, but I will say, I think that kind of technological solution to global warming right. is, is, to my mind, a bit wrong-headed because then, okay, a, I don't think it's going to work, and B, even if it did work, what are we committing ourselves to in terms of now we're going to manage the entire global uh, weather and hydrologic cycle? Right, and we're going to pollute the planet and, and the yeah. soils and so forth. Right, right. <clears throat> I mean, I think um, we tend to underestimate how well, how good a job nature does with these right. things. And exactly. So I'm not a big fan of the, those kinds of technical fixes. Yeah, there are great water filters that, by the way, yeah. for personal use for everybody. Yeah. And if you just do some research on them. They're easy to find. I mean, yeah. you know, you just go to, yeah. you know, a Home and, Depot and it, or something. And it's, while well, actually it's worth it going beyond that, mm -hmm. it's, it's something, it's one of those things where, where when you buy the inexpensive you know, when they give you the inexpensive printer with the computer, you think that's a good deal only until you find right. out that it costs you $40 right. every month for, for the ink, all right? And it's the same thing with the water filters. You buy the in, inexpensive you, water filter. Are you filter. talking about cartridge sales devices? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you, you buy the inexpensive printer. filter and you yeah. end up spending a huge amount of money on, on cartridges. If you right. spend a, about $1,000 on a really good filter system, yeah. We had one at our wellness center, and we even provided water for hundreds of people that came yeah. to visit us. And we replaced one filter after two years. It cost us was six, that sixteen dollars. It was a combination of um, it's, it's a system that was developed by the University of Houston, uh, the chemical engineering department, and it's been now scaled down to a size that'll go under your sink. And the, the, the bodies that asked for it to be developed was the Nuclear Regulatory Agency, Intel, and Merck. And they all needed a system that would right. give them clinically pure water. Right, right. And it's called Pure Water Systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can look it up. It's a it's Pure Water Systems, plural. And it's a combination of superfine carbon, reverse osmosis, and deionization. Okay. So it, it even gets out radioactive particles and so forth. Great. So that's a great, great one. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to know what you think about reverse osmosis and what water filtration system you have in your house. Yeah. Um, so the choice of water filtration system is, is very dependent on what your water supply is. Um, if you are, 
in a city, for example, that is served by a river that has multiple, you know, multiple cities on it, multiple users um, upstream, then you're dealing with a huge range of potential contamination um, and reverse osmosis starts to be the right choice. I happen to live in Seattle where we have a protected reservoir, so there's not likely to be much in the way of chemical contamination. So I can just use you know, a, more, a more standard um, cartridge filter. Um, but you know, I mean, if you want to be on the safe side, reverse osmosis is a good option. Um, but, but often, it, you know, a simple cartridge will take you a long way towards uh, having water that's of the quality that you probably deserve. Um, you know, usually they're packed carbon cartridges, and um, um, it takes out some fluoride. But I am, I mean, don't throw anything at me. But I'm not as worried about <laughs> fluoride as as some people are. I, I mean, I. I you know, I, th I think one has to be careful because it's, you know, if you're getting fluoride in your water and in your toothpaste and you're getting it from a lot of sources, you, you need fluoride. But whether you need as much as you might get from drinking water, uh, that can be an issue. The fluoride for the drinking water as aluminum waste production mm -hmm. versus fluoride that might be found naturally in the earth. Right. But, I mean, if you live in an area that has low fluoride naturally occurring in the water, you're going to have better teeth. Um, and stronger bones if you have fluoride. And th no, there are also areas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can we can have that discussion offline. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you spoke of advanced treatments mm -hmm. for our water, yeah. Um, could you number one list some what you think is advanced treatments? Okay. And uh, are you speaking advanced for America? or advanced worldwide. Because when I was in Europe, they pretty much laughed at me when I said we use chlorine to clean our water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For many, many years in Sweden, they use ultraviolet purple light. The water right. tastes good. Right. And there's no harmful side effects right. in right. all the problems right. that chlorine. Right. Right. So are we talking world advances or just Small advances yeah, for yeah. America. Uh, <laughs> good question. Um, let me say, I, when I, I gave a talk at, at, this, at CDC once about chlorination byproducts and cancer. And um, after the talk, a guy in the back of the room raised his hand. He said, you know, I'm from Germany. I'm not going to imitate his accent, but I'm from Germany. And the, in Germany, we consider if the water has chlorine in it, we consider that to be dirty water. You know, and, and I, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy. If, if chlorine were a food additive, it would be banned, okay, because of, I mean, of the, chlorine, the effects of the chlorination byproducts. So um, you're touching on two things. I mean, water treatment primarily involves filtration and disinfection. And I, you know, for filtration, you're talking about fiber filters mostly, I mean, uh, or, um, membrane filters, uh, nanofiltration. So you can, re you can get most of the particles or, or most of, you can largely purify that water just with that filter. And so you almost don't need disinfection at all. In fact, you don't necessarily need disinfection if you have a good membrane filter except to protect against contamination down the line. I mean, one of the, and, and I think UV is a great option. UV kills cryptosporidium, and so UV has been introduced in a lot of places. Uh, ozone is used in a lot of places, although there's issues when you add ozone, you can get bromates forming, and bromates are carcinogens, so you have to be careful what kind of water you add it to. The justification that's often used for adding chlorine is it provides a residual disinfectant, because you saw those pipes, I mean, the, the sources of contamination in the distribution system uh, are manifold and um, they are, you know, you don't want to put this absolutely pure water into dirty pipes 
and just have another problem when you get to the tap. Um, that's why I really think advanced filtration is a filter at the tap because then you don't have to worry about what happens in the distribution system so much. You can really have very pure water just coming right out of the tap. So a, you know, a, membra a membrane filter at the tap is, would be my idea of a, you know, with a good water treatment system at the source and a clean water supply before that, and good pipes would be nice too, then you have what I would consider to be an adequate water supply system. Um, and one might want to think about, you know, th that way you can, you can treat the water that you're going to drink, that small percent that you're going to drink, to an adequate level that it deserves. Thanks. I've got two questions. You mentioned the correlation between bladder cancer and chlorine. What about <laughs> the swimming pool? That's a great question. It's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I don't know. The, the, you know, there have been sort of limited studies of uh, the exposures you get from, from swimming. Um, there have not been compelling studies, partly because you don't, you know, there's a lot more people that drink chlorinated water in frequently than people who swim regularly in chlorinated pools. But, you know, if, when I'm looking for a swimming pool, I try to find one that, you know, doesn't use chlorine or uses very low levels of chloramines to treat the water because I don't particularly think it's a great idea to be swimming in heavily chlorinated pools. Thank you. Yeah. And my next question, you mentioned about the filter being the tap. What about the filter on the shower heads as well? Uh, good question. I mean, it, um, the, you know, unless you have grossly contaminated water, the, my biggest concern in showers is going to be the, the chlorination byproducts that come out. Um, if you have high levels of chlorination byproducts, you can get either, you can, there's filters that you can put at the shower head or you can get whole house filters that will reduce the levels of chlorination byproducts uh, coming out of the shower. Again, um, how you do your point of use filters depends a lot on the, the quality of the water coming into the house. But uh, if you have a source that has high levels of chlorination byproducts, I would suggest thinking about that as an option, yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Hi there. Uh, my question is actually regarding to the nitrous fixers filtration in our water system that we use to actually treat the sewage. Um, because of the high levels of nitrous we have to cause, have you ever seen or found anything that has to link with um, DNA alterations? Um, nitrates in drinking water have been associated with this effects on infants, blue baby syndrome, and um, that's the primary concern. But um, you know, I mean, you're talking about water, the water, the wastewater treatment side of this, yeah. so. Um, it, it's sort of, it's a different issue in terms of how that's going to affect um, the drinking water. Um, you know, you, you, there's a lot of, there's standards in terms of reducing levels of nitrates in drinking water to prevent health effects related to that. Well, the reason I ask is because um, from my studies when I, when I used to uh, back in my schooling, it shows that some of that water leaks into agricultures and affects plants, and they also use some of those nitrous fixers to increase the plant growth. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you've seen it with the, like you said, the blue baby syndrome, if you've yeah. seen that affect the livestock or any humans. Um, I'm not familiar with a study looking at that, but you know, I don't think those are things you want in high quantities in your drinking water. Okay, thank okay. you. How about those machines that uh, take the moisture from the air and give you drinking water? Are, is there a risk of if there's pollutants in the air that they'll actually, the water will have the pollutants? Um, I think you would get, you get pretty clean water out of those systems because you're, you know, the water vapor that you're getting out is relatively pure water. Um, and the, the, the concentrations of pollutants, I mean, it would depend, I suppose, on where you place the thing. 
and what was in the air where you placed it. And you know, if you, if you were in a location where the air quality was particularly bad, you might have some issues mm -hmm. with that. I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The International Plumbing Code, which is adopted by all counties in the United States and throughout the world, allows for chlorine, iodine, and ozone for disinfection. We know how you feel about chlorine, which is in group two of the periodic table with two electrons in the, seven electrons in the outer shell. Um, iodine has seven electrons in the outer shell, and so does fluoride. So the real thing is halogen displacement of the iodine. What is your opinion on the disinfection of iodine and ozone, according to the International Plumbing Code? And, um, you know, we know how you feel about chlorine, but consider fluoride as a halogen, and it displaces the uh, heavier iodine atom. But what's your opinion about iodine and ozone for disinfection? Okay, iodine is, I mean, it's not commonly used for treating public water supplies. I, I, um, you know, I think you, anytime you add a halogen, you, there's, a, there's a potential risk there. Um, and I'm not saying there's no risk related to fluorine. I just, it's a, it's a lower quantity that it's put in the water. Um, as ozone is a different compound. I mean, it, you know, it's, and it, ozone, um, disappears relatively rapidly. You can form some um, ozonated compounds, like bromate in particular, that can pose a risk. Um, but so it, it needs to be looked at very carefully in terms of the actual local water supply. I mean, what the the what comes out of a water treatment plant after disinfection is heavily influenced by what's in the water before you add that disinfectant. And you know, if you add these things to absolutely pure water, you're gonna just get uh, an ion floating around. If you add them to water that's got a lot of organic matter in it, you get a huge array of organic compound, of, uh, of halogenated organic compounds. And I'm a little uncomfortable with halogenated organic compounds, yeah. So um, I, would, I would suggest that uh, Iodine, iodine isn't widely used and should be viewed with a level of caution similar to chlorine. It hasn't, there haven't been a lot of studies because it's not widely used. I mean, it's this whole problem of how do you prove the risk until you start killing people. Right? I live in the Clearwater area and over there they put in the fluoride and chloramine. So I went down to my local store down to Home Depot, Walmart, Lowe's, and I saw some pretty filters. In fact, expensive and pretty. And so I wrote down the phone numbers and I called those companies and I asked, when I call up, do you get rid of fluoride? Do you get rid of chloramines? And sometimes they would say, what's, what's that? And so I found that I had to really go online and do my own research to get rid of some of those high-tech chemicals. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a good source of information for that is the National Sanitation Foundation. They're the people who certify filters and tell you what a given filter will take out. And they've got a pretty good website in terms of telling you what filters will take out what compounds. So I would suggest you go there and, and you should be able to find the information you need pretty easily. Yeah. Hi, I wanted to talk about the iPhone. Um, I used to have a phone in the 90s, which was very costly when I got my first cell phone and I didn't notice anything happening. But since I've been using my iPhone, if I use that phone up to this side of my head, I notice that I have heat coming from it, a pain coming from it, and it's like it's heating up my brain. So I'm very sensitive to that mm -hmm. kind of frequency coming from that phone. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, I just do what I'm supposed to do and, you know, just talk on the speaker. Um, what I'm really worried about is I see a lot of teenagers and young children getting iPhones. Parents are buying the iPhones for these children yeah. and babies that are playing with yeah. the iPhone and using the icons, you know, because it's movable, something on the phone, parents talking, having coffee, not watching these children. Um, we have a study going on in Ontario right now uh, the children in the school in Collingwood, in Ontario, were getting very ill in the school. When they went out for recess, they felt better. When they went home again, 
they were sick again. So stomach cramps, indigestion, tired, not able to think straight, dizzy. And there's a study going on now that the Wi-Fi is affecting them. So the children then went to school and they went home with the Wi-Fi and it was never turned off. We're having major problems. So we're trying to prove that it's okay to have computers. We can't ever get rid of them. But let's take the routers out of all the places in the, in the school and stop letting them come to school with phones in their hands. And, you know, and there's a, the, the new research now is that they're trying to make a phone for nine-year-olds. They figure that's the age they should have their own uh, iPhone. So that's what I'm worried about. And the parents have no idea that any of this is happening because it's just coming to fruition now. Like, we're just all talking about it now. Yeah. Right? Right. I mean, you, there's, there's a lot of, there's at least two or three interesting questions folded up in what you just said. Um, so, I, I, you know, first of all, in terms of kids with phones, um, you know, I think the developing brain, especially in very young kids, uh, is particularly susceptible to any harmful effects. Uh, and so, from that perspective, mm -hmm. there's some concerns about young kids, especially very young kids, being around phones and you know, holding them up to their ears. The, the, by the way, the, the amount of radiation from a phone goes down with the square of the distance. So it, it, the, you, you don't have to move it away from your head very far to have a dramatic decrease in the level of exposure that you're getting. You know, it's like being on the speakerphone. The level is you know, so much smaller than what you get holding it up here that you're, you know, you're pretty safe holding it here. The good thing about most kids is they don't, they, you know, they think talking on the phone is something old people do and they're all texting. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and there's, you know, and I have concerns just in terms of putting the internet in a kid's pocket. I think there's, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's a whole other set of issues that, uh, that I uh, am in many ways more concerned about um, in terms of the social and effects of these devices. The, in terms of the, the relationship between uh, the issue of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi does use a similar kind of signal as a cell phone. Uh, it is, tends to be much weaker than the signal that you get holding a cell phone up. Um, I think you don't want to be close to routers. I think often very powerful routers are put into um, places like schools. Um, that unnecessarily, I think there. Um, I think there's some there's some utility in Wi-Fi that it's you know it's a little hard to get around. But I think, um, I mean, France they've banned them in elementary schools. I don't think you need Wi-Fi routers in elementary schools. I think um, you know if you get start to get into middle schools and high schools where you're expecting kids to be able to move around with a computer and take notes on them, it's a very useful device. Mm -hmm. I think. We don't want to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater on this one, but I, you know, and it, so I think it, you know, a certain amount of caution is definitely merited, and looking at issues like you're talking about is certainly warranted. Um, I, I, I am not somebody who would say, you know, let's get rid of all the Wi-Fi because of, of its utility, and actually, uh, the signal that you get when you have your phone on Wi-Fi is much lower than what you would have if you were trying to use the internet on a phone using a, a, the, the connection through your um, service provider. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. I appreciate your, your time and attention. <laughs>